Good morning, church. Let me ask you a question. Let me start with this question. How many of you have participated in some sort of a race? Raise your hand. Okay, we have some athletes in the room. That's good. It could be a simple 5K marathon or a 3K feel good, hang around with your friends type of deal or a lifelong type of training competition. The Olympic Games just ended a few weeks ago and in those games, we were able to hear inspiring stories about the athletes from all over the world. It is an amazing event that we all follow somehow. The Apostle Paul uses many illustrations from the world to communicate the truth about the Christian life. For example, he uses the military when he says, put on the whole armor of God. He uses agriculture when he says, whatsoever a man saws, he would also reap. He also uses the athletics to describe the Christian life in which we are all running the race of faith. Today, we continue with our sermon series entitled All Things New, and we will talk about new ambitions. As we have come to know Christ, our life has a new purpose, and therefore, our ambitions are completely different. Let us remember that Philippians is the pistol of joy from the Apostle Paul, and his situation is not easy. He was, uh, he had all the reasons to be grumpy, upset, frustrated, and mad. And sometimes we have all those reasons without a reason. He was waiting to be sentenced to be free or to be beheaded. And he was chained in a Roman prison in the house. He wasn't allowed to preach or to teach, but he was allowed and inspired by the Holy Spirit to to teach through his writings. And he writes this epistle of joy in spite of all the circumstances. And we see this. And he alludes to four things that could steal your joy. And the first one is circumstances. All circumstances could steal your joy. Second one is people. And he's dealing with things in the church, in, in Philippi, in Corinth, and Rome, and all those places. Things, things will tend to really steal our joy. If I have these things, if things happen the way that I didn't expect, that tends to steal our joy. And worry, that's the worst thief of all. We worry about things that might never happen. So as a response, he, he develops this argument of, uh, about four attitudes, about the mindset of Jesus Christ. And he's talking about Jesus and the power of his resurrection. So in chapter one, he talks about the single mind. And in the single mind, it focuses on the relationship with Christ. And that's where he says, for, for me to live is Christ and to die it is gain. And he also says, he's not finished with me yet. And in, in chapter two, he talks about the submissive mind. And he talks about having that relationship with Christ and having the attitude of Christ. Chapter three, he talks about the spiritual mind. And it is this contrast between earthly things and spiritual things. And in chapter four, he talks about the secure mind. It focuses on guarding your heart and just focusing on the promises ahead of us, the future. So today we are studying one of my favorite passages of the scriptures. It has become an inspirational, emotive, and in a sense, a lifelong statement for me. It is without a doubt a precious portion of God's word, and we find ourselves in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16, just look in your Bibles, or it's going to be there on the screen. All those of you online, welcome, and thanks for tuning in. This is what God's words said. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. In Philippians 3, Paul gave us his spiritual biography and he talks about his past and we looked at that passage last week, verses 1 to 11, and then he talks about his present in these verses and then he will talk about his future, verses 17 to 21. We have met Paul the accountant who discovered new values as he met Jesus Christ and in this section we meet Paul the athlete with his spiritual emphasis pressing toward the finish line in the Christian race. And in the final section, we will see Paul as the alien having his citizenship in heaven and looking forward to the coming of Christ. And we also look forward to the coming of Christ. Amen? Come on, you got to help me out. Thank you. Well, in this section, we see the Apostle Paul like that. He was looking at things on earth from God's point of view. And as a result, all the things made sense to him. He was not upset by the things behind him, around him, or before him. Things did not steal his joy. And in this paragraph, it is Paul the athlete. And Bible scholars are undecided if he's referring to a foot race or a chariot race. Either one will do, but I incline myself to the chariot race. The Greek chariot used in the Olympic Games and other events was only a small platform with a wheel on each side. The driver had to uh, do very little to hold on to as he raced around the course. He had to lean forward to strain every nerve and muscle to maintain balance, imagine this, and control the horses. Wow. Now, to participate in the grid games, the athlete had to be a citizen. So he didn't, he didn't run the race to gain his citizenship, neither do we run the race to win our salvation. We see that clearly. But we need to run the race set before us. This is what the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, work out your own salvation. For it is God who worked in you. So each believer is on the track. And each has a special lane in which to run. And each has a goal to achieve. Par cities, all those online, we are in a race. Wanted or not, we are in a race. If we reach the goal the way God has planned, then we receive a reward. And if we fail, we lose the reward, but we do not lose our citizenship. So all of us want to be winning athletes. At least I want to be one of those. I don't know about you, but I want to be. So let's look at some essentials that we see here as we run this race of faith. The first one is a sanctified dissatisfaction. Yes, a sanctified dissatisfaction. Look at verse 12. It says, not that I have already obtained all this or that I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Not that I have already obtained all this. This is the statement of a Christian who will never permit himself or herself to be satisfied with his or her spiritual attainments. And obviously, the Apostle Paul was satisfied with Jesus Christ. In verse 10, we, say, we see what he says, you know, knowing him and the power of his resurrection. He's satisfied with Jesus, but he was not satisfied with his Christian life. A sanctified dissatisfaction is the first essential to progress in the Christian race. An athlete that is satisfied with his physical condition is not going to win many races. And many Christians are self-satisfied because they compare their running with that of other Christians, usually those who are not making much progress. <laughs> Had Paul compared himself with others, he would have been tempted to be proud or perhaps to let the ego build up a little bit in him. 
After all, there were not too many believers as Paul in those days. Come on, Paul. He's one of my heroes. And he's saying here, I have not arrived. There is a dual sense of the word and use of the word perfect in Philippians 3.12 and 3.15, which explains this thinking. And the question is, are you satisfied with your spiritual life? And I hope the answer is an O, no. Are you satisfied with your spiritual condition? And I hope the answer is an O, no. Paul had not arrived yet at perfection, but he was perfect. The word perfect means mature in verse 15. And one mark of his maturity is the knowledge that he is not perfect. The mature Christian honestly evaluates himself or herself and strives to do better every single day, knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection and looking forward to the day of meeting Jesus. But while we see Jesus, we want to look like Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. The church at Sardis, in Revelation, they thought they were good and they were alive, but the Bible says they were dead. In contrast to other churches in the book of Revelation, the believers in Smyrna thought that they were poor, but the Bible says that they were rich. They had reputation without reality, (laughs) and that's what happens to most of us. Self-evaluation can be a good thing, or a dangerous thing, because we can err in two directions. First one, making ourselves better than we are. You know, I'm better than that other person. I I don't sin as much. The other day, a a guy came to me and he said, Pastor, I haven't seen in like two months. And I said, good for you. You haven't seen in two months? Wow. You also like glorified. (laughs) He's like, no, I I have this habit, but the Lord is allowing me to do it. Well, that's good. You are in the process as we all, all are. In Philippians 3.13 says, reaching forth, reaching forth, which literally means a stretching as in a race. You know, the second error that we make is making ourselves worse than we really are. Oh, we can never be like, like Pastor Rodney. We can never be, oh no, we can never be like this other person. He's my friend, so that's what I pick on him. How many times God is stretching us in our race of faith? You know, the psalm says, Psalms 42, 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? This is the psalm. It says, I have a spiritual dissatisfaction. There is another essential to run the race, and it is a committed devotion. Verse 13b says, but one thing I do. One thing I do. It is a phrase that is important to the Christian life. For example, one thing you lack, Jesus said to the self-righteous young ruler. One thing is needed, Jesus explained to V.C. Martha when she criticized Mary. One thing I know is claim the men who have received the sight by the power of Christ. He said, one thing I know, I don't know about you, but one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. One thing I have desire of the Lord that I will seek after, testify David, the psalmist. What is that one thing in your life? That one thing. Too many Christians are involved in too many things when the secret of progress is to concentrate on one thing, and that one thing is to know more of Jesus, to know him more. The believer must devote himself or herself to running the Christian race. No athlete succeeds by doing everything. He succeeds by specializing. There are a few athletes that are good in every sport. I don't know if you remember, but Michael Jordan decided to play baseball after he retired. He wasn't as good. Look at the videos. The winners are those who concentrate, who keep their eyes on the goal and let nothing distract them. They are like Nehemiah, the wall-building governor. He replied to his distracting invitations, I'm doing a great work so I cannot calm down. I I am just building with one hand and defending with the other one. You know what? I don't have time for you. (laughs) I don't have time. Church, 
PCBC family, we are doing great work of discipling others, and we cannot be distracted. God is doing amazing things in our church. You know, you can see that in, in the children's ministry, in the youth ministry, in the women's ministry, in the Spanish service. You know, we, we relaunched this ministry a year ago in person, and we have baptized more than 20 people, and today we are baptizing three. God is doing amazing things. It might not think, it might not look like the way that you expected it, or I expected it, but that's the way that God works. God works in his ways. There is another fundamental essential to run the race, and it is a defined direction. Verse 13c says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. The unsaved person is controlled by the past, but the Christian running the race looks toward the future. That's the difference. Imagine what would happen in the race course if the runners are just looking behind. Have you looked at those like that? I haven't seen anyone doing this. They will fall, they will stumble, and they will get in the lane of someone else. And that's what happens to many believers. Looking backwards instead of looking forward. That's the difference. Please keep in mind that in the Bible terminology, to forget doesn't mean to fail to remember. We have that notion somehow. Apart from brain malfunction, no mature person can forget what has happened in the past. We might wish that we could erase bad memories, but we cannot, and we struggle a great deal with our past, don't we? We all do. Are you struggling with your past? To forget, in the Bible means to no longer be influenced by or affected by. That's what it means. To no longer be influenced by or affected by. So when God promises their sins and iniquities will I remember no more, he's not suggesting that he will conveniently have a bad memory. This is impossible with God. He is God. He knows everything. What he is saying is this. Pay attention. I will no longer hold their sins against them. Their sins can no longer affect their standing with me or influence my attitude toward them. God has forgiven us. Our past sins cannot and should not influence our present. Why can we not forgive ourselves? Brothers and sisters, God has forgiven us, and we cannot forgive ourselves. So forgetting those things which are behind doesn't suggest an impossible feat of mental and psychological gymnastics by which we try to erase the sins and mistakes of the past. It simply means that we break the power of the past by living for the future. If you get this statement, please just write it, hashtag Rolando Aguirre. We break the power of the past by living for the future. That's the whole point of this, this sermon. Please, just write it. Please, just write it. We break the power of the past by living for the future. Oh, the Apostle Paul had so many things in his mind that could have become weights to hold him back. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 17 when you have time. But they became inspiration to speed him ahead. He transformed the horrific memories of his past and inexperiences that would allow him now to glorify God. The events did not change, but the understandings of them change. The same thing happens with us. We cannot change our past, but we can change the meaning of it. A good example of this principle is Joseph in the scriptures. When he met his brothers in the second time after many years have passed and he revealed, he revealed himself to them and he held no grudge against them. Remember, they had mistreated him. They had sold him as slave and lied to his father that he was dead. Only that. Only that. However, Joseph saw the past from God's point of view, the spiritual mind. Chapter 3, spiritual mind, Philippians. Joseph knew that God had a plan for his life, a race for him to run. And in fulfilling that plan and looking ahead, he broke the power of the past to move forward. We need to break the power of the past to move forward. Too many Christians are influenced by the regrets of the past. They are trying to run the race by looking backward. And we cannot do that. 
Some other Christians are being distracted by the successes of the past. This is just as bad. The way it should be and it used to be. Well, it is not any longer. <laughs> Let's move forward. Pre-pandemic and during pandemic and post-pandemic, everything will be different. But God remains the same. Amen? The gospel remains the same. The Great Commission remains the same. And we keep winning people for the Lord in this church. And that Great Commission history that we have will continue to be our mission endeavor. The word continues to be the same. The power of the Holy Spirit continues to be the same. And we have believers here convinced that we are transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. And yes, I miss maybe preaching to a full sanctuary in a ministry that I came before in the Hispanic service at Calvary. It was full and, and I came and the pandemic hit. And then when we open, we have few. Uh, is somebody going to show up? Are things going to work? Yes. God is doing amazing things. He's, he's at work. And he's at work in your life and my life. And he's at work in this church. And fourth, we have to have a strong determination. Chapter 3, verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Pay attention to the phrase, I press on. Say it with me, I press on. Okay, you can do better than that. I press on. Okay, thank you. The same verb translated, I follow after, in many sections in the New Testament is here. It carries the idea of intense endeavor. It carries the idea of sacrifice and pain. A man doesn't become a winning athlete or a woman by listening to lectures or watching movies or YouTube videos or reading books or cheering at the games. No. They become winning athletes by getting into the game and getting to the crossing line, the finish line. The same seal that Paul employed when he persecuted the church, he displayed in serving Christ. Sometimes we think that we need to have this mindset, I can do it all, or God can do it all. The first describes the activist, and the second describes the quietist, and both are wrong. Let go and let God is a clever slogan, but it doesn't fully describe the progress of Christian living. The Bible says, without me, you can do nothing. God works in us that he might work through us. And the Bible says, train yourself to be godly. There's got to be a determination toward the goal. If the runner is pressing with such a spiritual determination, he's going to win. He's eager to win the prize. The prize is high, it's upward. It's the calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize is being with Jesus. And I long for that day that we are all from different nations and different cultures in heaven glorifying the Lord. There is something dangerous about a man and a woman who has been set free to run the race. Men and women who are set free cannot be conformed to the modus operandi of the moment. Remember, it was a free man who approached Pharaoh and asked him, let my people go. Remember that story in Sunday school? It was a free man who stepped into the promised land and declared, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was a free woman that said, if I perish, well, I perish. What a strong determination. It was a free man who stood against Goliath and said, you come against me with sword and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. It was a free man who refused to bow down to the image of gold, even in the midst of a fiery furnace. It was a free man who prayed for fire from heaven and then had the audacity to say, get ready, here comes the rain. <laughs> And he was a free divine king who said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. Church, so we press on. We press on. I have seen the determination of our church to be faithful to a grace-driven, Bible-based, spirit-led teaching with a missional emphasis. And I will continue to see that here. And lastly, we need also a community of faith. Look at what verses 15 and 16 tells us. All of us then 
who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. We cannot run the race by ourselves. We need to run together. Pay attention to the term, all of us. The apostle moves from the individual to the collective. We need to run together, fellows. We need to run together. It takes a community to accomplish God's purposes. Oh, and his love and his justice are the only ones who will endure this world. For example, there are many who thought that the kingdom of God will lose power, vision, and purpose by the end of the 21st century. You know, there are some who, instead of prophesying the truth, they prophesied. <laughs> they lied. In 1917, Vladimir Lenin declared that by the end of the 21st century, communism would reign supreme over the world and the Christian faith will no longer exist. In 1939, in Germany, Hitler said that the Church of Christ will not even exist by the end of the 21st century. And in the 1960s, the Beatles said that they will receive more adoration than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit combined. Hmm. We are here on September 26, 2021, in Dallas, Park Cities. And I know this. Lenin is dead, Hitler is dead, the Beatles are gone, but the Church of Christ is still alive and is running the race of faith. That's what I know. So, the application is, do not give up. We all tend to give up sometimes. I'm the first one. Sometimes it's like, really, Lord? <laughs> do not give up. Let the past in the past. Please, just let it. It's like the frozen sun. Let it go. <laughs> my daughter liked it, you know, for a while. Oh, let it go, let it go. It's taking my head. <laughs> Let's apply it spiritually now. Just let it go. Yes, you had so many things in the past. Yeah, we, we all do. But just put it on the cross of Jesus. We look forward. Persevere in the race of faith. Please. Let's strengthen one another. Let's encourage one another. If you haven't seen somebody in church lately, just call them. And let Christ run with you. Please do that. He wants to run with you. He's with you in the race and at the end of the race. The world's largest and toughest race is an ultra marathon of 543 miles long. And it begins in Sydney, Australia, and it ends in Westfield, Doncaster, Melbourne, Australia. In 1983, 150 world-class athlete, athletes converged in Sydney to begin this race, and they wanted to participate. They, they brought all the gear, and they were ready to run, and out of the crowd comes walking this 61-year-old farmer who wanted to run. His name was Cliff Young. He comes with his work boots, his overalls, and he asks for a number. And they laugh and they say, are you going to participate? And he says, yes, I want to participate. They finally laughed at him and they said, just give him a number. Number 64. Mr. Young will take care of 2,000 sheep in a farm that didn't have a lot of equipment. So when it would rain, he had to run to gather them and put them in a place that it was safe. It would take him about one to two or three days to just gather 2,000 sheep. They could be wandering around. So they look at him and the race begins. And Mr. Jong has this leisurely odd shuffle. Like this. They laughed. He was like this. They're just cracking up. It's like, this guy, he's 61 years old and he's running. You know, this happened. Five days and 15 hours and four minutes later, Cliff Young shuffled across the finish line in first place. He won the race. Now, he did not win the race by a few seconds or minutes. The nearest runner behind him was nine hours, 
56 minutes behind him. You can Google it. Almost 10 hours behind. In order to run this ultra marathon, they were conditioned to run for 16 hours and sleep six hours for five days. Nobody told that to Mr. Young. <laughs> Figure that out. So he won the race. And he became a national hero. And then professional athletes were studying his shuffle. <laughs> and they adopted it because of his aerodynamics and energy efficiency. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> the point is this. Victory comes by enduring. The Christian life is not an 100-meter race. It's an ultra marathon. Maybe you are shuffling to get to the finish line, and that's okay. So let's do this. Oof. Let's do this. Oh, church. Oh, poor cities. We have to put on the shoes, the tennis shoes, and we have to run the race. Maybe you run. Maybe you're just going to shuffle to the finish line, and that's okay. Let us run the race before us. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Ready, set, let's pray. Lord, you are so good. We cannot run by ourselves. You designed the race. You called us to be part of your family, to run in each lane of the race. But we stumble. We look back. We are distracted. And Lord, you remind us all over again, and today precisely, that you want us to press on, to look forward, to be all about Jesus and the power of his resurrection. So I pray for each individual who is here, each family member, all those who are tuning in online. And I pray that we can leave our past in our past, that we are not influenced or affected by it, but we can move forward through the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And yes, Lord, some of us are just shuffling, are tired, but then you give us new strength. We pray all these things in Christ's name.